You are listening to the Intelligent Vocalist Podcast, episode 111. Welcome to the Intelligent Vocalist with John Henney. This is the podcast dedicated to help you be a smarter, better, more informed singer. And now, your host for the Intelligent Vocalist, John Henney. Hey there, this is John Henney. Welcome back to another episode of The Intelligent Vocalist. I do so appreciate you spending your precious listening time with me. All right, today I am excited to present my interview with Natalie Weiss. Now, if you are unfamiliar with Natalie, you need to go straight to YouTube and type in her name because she has a fantastic series called Breaking Down the Riffs where she breaks down riffs, uh, complicated riffs, and teaches them to you in ways that are easy to understand. It's really a fantastic series. She also has a video of her coaching. She's a top-notch coach, and there are videos of her singing, and she's just a phenomenal singer. And you will hear in this interview, she will just um, impromptu do demonstrations with her voice that are just fantastic. Uh, We're on a Skype connection, and uh, sometimes the connection gets a little funny, but even through Skype, you can just hear how absolutely wonderful she is. And we discuss her early vocal struggles. This did not come Uh, super easy to her. Uh, We discuss how she learns riffs, uh, also how she prepares for performance days, I think, which is very instructive. Uh, And most importantly, she, she talks about the sensations of singing. And I want you to listen to how she talks about and discusses her approach to singing and how she thinks about singing. And it's, it's not coming from a, a nerdy kind of voice science way, uh, which is something I'm obviously passionate about, but Natalie really embodies that critical step of getting the sensations of the voice into your body, into your nervous system, and into your awareness. In fact, uh, my previous podcast episode to this one uh, discusses that explicitly, why you need to really understand and catalog sensations. So I think that is a great uh, takeaway from this interview. So without further ado, I present Natalie Weiss. Okay, I am on with Natalie Weiss. Natalie, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm so appreciative. I I have to say, I put out a uh, request for my listeners to see what guests they want, and you were the most requested guest. That's crazy. Yeah, yes, you were. So, um, but what I want to do, it people, you you kind of have a, a unique thing going in that you're you're a really gifted entertainer and singer. But you're also a really good coach as well. And so you're you're working both ends of it. And um, not all of us do. uh, And certainly not as well as you. And when someone sings as effortlessly as you, people will often assume that it was all just natural and you didn't have to work at it. And can you just take us back to maybe a time where you were vocally struggling and, and trying to put your voice together? If you rewind to my childhood, like I had a musical ability. I was classically trained on the piano first. My parents could tell that I was musical, so they put me in piano lessons. Yep. So I started on the piano and like, you know, I didn't really, I sang around the house, but my main thing was like, I really wanted to be a pop star growing up. I would go to pop concerts. That's kind of how it started. Who were some of your idols? That so you- Billy Joel and Janet Jackson and Madonna. Like I went to a Madonna concert at age five, which is very inappropriate. <laughs> Phones on the boobs and stuff. Um, wow. Yeah. So definitely like exposed to pop music early, uh, was not like I went to musicals. Maybe I went to my first show at maybe seven or 10, but we weren't a musical theater family. We were more so pop. Like my dad listened to all the seventies pop, eighties pop. So I grew up listening to it. So I think I was imitating singers pretty early and there's like early videos of me, um, trying to riff and can't, but like trying to do it. Um, And then I think like at the talent show at school, I was a piano player. And then the next year I was like, why don't I sing? And my performance quality was like, 
you know, swaying and no emotion, just, you know, singing a Whitney Houston song. And I sang the greatest love of all. And I can't find the video anywhere, but it went from like, okay, singing, no vibrato, vocal damage very early on. Like I had nodules when I was three and 13. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. So I was the child who was like, eh, like the crazy child who was like yelling and go to speech therapy very early because I was screaming. So I was scoped so early. Yeah. Um, Wasn't, didn't have aspirations of being a singer that young. I was just screaming. Um, So when I was 13 and I was actually uh, doing a show in middle school, I had no head voice. So I was like, ah, and just air. So I had to go to a laryngologist really early and I don't remember how I healed, but I had no training at all. Just screaming, chest voice, chest voice. Um, I was Peter Pan at age 10 and it was nodules. Like just all the lines were just hoarse. I mean, I had no vibrato yet. Um, and then at 11, I all of a sudden was singing like, I believe the children are future, teach them well and let them lead the way. Not that tone, but like, I remember like, show them all the beauty they possess inside. And then my parents were like, wait, what? You know, like I definitely had the ability to riff and the vibrato started coming in. Uh, so then. Okay, I, I, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt, but did you, did you start to feel a different pocket in your voice? This, this release from just being locked in chest voice at that age? Did you discover this new place? No. So I would say not yet. So okay. 11 was like. I don't even know what the word head voice was. So I was just like, I guess, belting or singing a pop song. Okay. Uh, So definitely like, I wouldn't even say, I think maybe 10 was like very hoarse, 11 kind of hoarse, 13. I had whatever you, I think nodules at 13. So when I got scoped, it was ah, air. Then I worked with a voice teacher on even what head voice was. So like my first introduction was I was cast in seventh grade as, um, it seventh grade eighth grade as lady larkin in once upon a mattress and i was mad because i just wanted to play winifred because all i knew how to do is scream and so um i was i had to sing in my head voice and it was like it was like pop star head voice you know it was like nothing there so i learned like how to you know open up a little bit more going into freshman year, sophomore year, where I had a voice teacher in the high school, which was like very light voice lessons. But my voice lessons were like, oh, you can't belt it, just do it. Like it wasn't voice lessons. It was like sing through songs. I didn't really know how to sing. Yeah. And my head voice, I'd explain as pop star head voice, like just very thin, high larynx, like, eh, you know, lots more of, of an effect. It was an effect, lots of scoops. So I would sing um, song for Fiddler on the Roof. And it would be like, uh, let's see. Um, how can I hope to make you understand? And then my teacher was like, don't scoop. I'm like, what's a scoop? Like, I didn't know anything, you know? Yeah. So when I got to college, okay, so my first year of college, uh, I guess I, I was a good singer in high school. I could sing pop. I could belt. And I could sing in my head voice. It was thin. But there was no such terminology as a mix. Like, I didn't even know what that was. And so the first year, first day of freshman year, my teacher drew a diagram of like, you know, chest voice, head voice, mix, we were middle voice. We were like, what is this? And so I sang, the story goes on from baby. And the famous story of like, from my teacher is that I was like, I'm going to sing this song. And I sang like, the big belty part. I sort of switched into head voice there. And uh, I was like, her child will feel when I'm long gone, yes, all that was is part of me. And she was like, Natalie, the story went on, but your voice didn't. And that was like the famous funny story from my <laughs> teacher, who is Mary Saunders, who's Bel Canto Can Belto, if you follow any of that. But yeah, and I, I've actually uh, uh, read her book on uh, uh, cross training. Yeah. Yeah, that's- yeah, I'm actually going to be lecturing uh, with at a conference she's going to be lecturing at um, next month. Yeah, so I'm very sure. excited about that. So she definitely comes from that idea of of mixing both disciplines, which yeah. is actually still a little novel, although being more accepted, but it was kind of two camps yep, yep. In, in the voice world. So you were really fortunate to have somebody that was able to work you both ways. And so by by developing your chest, uh, your head voice, 
Yeah. How did you find your way into mix? So then I feel like, okay, so I just remember freshman year, really learning how to open up my head voice. Like, I had none of that. I was like, you know, um, learning from a few teachers, but mostly Mary, a little bit of Bev Patton, uh, very small lessons here and there. A couple one-offs with the voice faculty there of like tongue tension and just opening up head voice and having to sing art songs in different languages. And like, you know, my favorite thing is when people are like, oh, they just think that I know how to belt and riff. And I'm like, no, like I had to do everything in college. So I remember having to lower keys and I was like, no, I don't sing C sharps. No, I don't do that. You know, I remember specifically dancing all the time from big and there was, um, and my fly, what I, it was a D and I was like, no, I'll just lower it. I used to calculate exactly when I would be in what voice. Mm -hmm. And then slowly but surely with lots of cracking in college and sophomore year, I just remember like it clicked. I don't now, I don't remember exactly, but I do remember understanding what it was to balance my voice a little bit more than I had been. And then it was just about, Oh, I do everything. And it's about percentages of voices. So I think for me, it definitely clicked like a year and a half into college. And then it was just about continuing to train it and being able to sing all different styles. And and, you, and, and I know it just kind of felt like it just clicked, but looking back, do you, do you think it was more sensation driven that you just finally began to feel it or was a little more intellectual? Like, you know what? I need to control the position of my larynx and the shade of the vowel at certain points. Okay. So I don't think I was thinking about larynx or vowels or shade. I still don't even know sometimes about what's happening. I think it was definitely about like lots of soft palate raising. And we talked about like covering vowels were spreading and, uh, but then sometimes she'd be like belt more. And I'm like, you mean louder? Like I didn't understand. She just meant like more speech in it. So even now that I teach, I'm still asking her like, what are you talking about? You know? So I think for me, it was a feeling more so like than scientific what's going on. It was like visually yeah. helped. And even after graduation, like I, I sing some very difficult songs and I'm like, what am I doing? And I'll be like, I'm imagining a string pulling forward. And so that helped me. It has nothing to do with voice science. But then I asked Mary, like, oh my God, you taught me everything. And she told me you had the anatomy to be able to do it. And I'm like, oh. So even now as a teacher, I'm discovering the the slight changes I make with people in five minutes sometimes won't happen with other people for three years. Mm -hmm. And so I'm learning, uh, I don't know if it's like nature versus nurture, but it really is training versus natural ability. Uh, I think it's kind of mixed. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, there's a funny story where, where voice scientists were looking at, uh, how wide singers mouths are, how big their mouths are. And they, as they were measuring, the, the one of the widest mouths they measured was Idina Menzel's. And they calculated that that's why she's able to take that really intense belt chest equality so high because she's able to track resonances in a way that other singers can't just because of her anatomy. Oh, OK. Yeah. So now you, you using the terms uh, mix versus belt. And I know these terms get get argued and bandied about. What do you think of as a mix versus what you think of as a belt? Uh, okay. If you think of them differently at all. I think there's a different kind of mix. Yep. So I think when people come in and they're like, hi, I'd like to work on this song. I usually mix it, but do you want me to belt it? I'm like, stop. What are you saying? Mm -hmm. I think that what they think is a mix is a head mix, which is a twang head voice, which really isn't a belt, which is a fake belt. So I think what they think is like, yeah, is just not pleasurable. Mm -hmm. And it's twanged head voice because they haven't learned how to speak that high. So they need more speech with head in it. <laughs> I don't like to use the word chest voice a lot because chest voice um, makes people push a lot of times. So I just say the word speech all the time. But in terms of mixing, I mean, like, I think the epitome of head mix is like, um, can I use references like Jason Robert Brown, oh, um, sure. Mother Life? Like walking in, ah, ah, ah. that to me is like yeah, twanged head voice. Mm -hmm. if, to, if it needed a belt of your quality, walking in, that would be more speech mix. Yeah, beltier. Absolutely.
Yeah. And so when you're, um, let me see if I can phrase this right. I, I want to go uh, back to where you talked about they need more head voice in their speech, in their speaking voice. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate on that a little further? Because that's a really interesting idea in, in actually readjusting how somebody is using their voice constantly. Yeah. I feel like I still, somebody asked me this the other day. She's like, well, how do you do that? I'm like, oh God, I don't know. So it's like visually you're going speaking, 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 speaking. You can't possibly like chest, chest, chest. You have to, there's like a turn where we have to go. Ah, and then we add head in, but it's not a, ah, it's not a covered head voice. It's head into the speech. So it's 60% speech, 40% head as we get higher. And there's no way to high belt without that. Or else we're going like, uh, and also you can't sing in your mouth. Uh, you have to kind of, for me, as that gets higher, I'm kind of shifting into like eyebrow land. Mm-hmm. I'm talking, but apparently there's head in that speech is what I still am unclear about even sometimes. Yeah. But, but, and, and then you're feeling, um, so do you drive a lot by just the sensation? then? Oh, the sensation of lifting is yeah. uh, like the feeling of like, I mean, teacher once broke it down to me like an umbrella. If it's drizzling out and it's like raining, the the soft palette is it's like a imaginary pole going through my head. I'm constantly thinking on top of the note, whatever visual that is, even, even, and that if I have to sing a high belt note, I know it's coming. So let's say it's like a G. <laughs> I need to get the lift beforehand. Even if it's like a mental, nobody knows I'm doing it, but I'm not going, ah, or else I'm just not prepared. I have to be sitting on the note at all times. Right. I think the fancy term people use is, is uh, pre-phonatory tuning. Yeah. So, wow. So before phonation, you've, you've actually adjusted. Inhaling on the pitch. Yeah, yeah, you're right there. So everything's been adjusted before you apply the energy, as opposed to just taking a wild swing at it, and and people end up just pulling up from the bottom. Mm -hmm. So, and but what's what I love is your approach through through sensation and sound. You're you're nailing all these shades of the voice. Thanks. Like, like it's, it's, it's a great contemporary, what you call your, your fake belt or that reinforced head voice. And then your belt is just tuned. I mean, your vowels are just beautiful. But also like people, you know, I was like, I actually, this was something I learned last year. Like I belt, but I don't always belt. It is a color mm -hmm. I have. So like in order to preserve my voice, if I'm doing a long concert, there's certain vowels that I do spread that I prefer to spread. And if I'm like nearly dying in a concert, I am covering and not a ooh, but I am thinking a little diagonal. So I'm not going ah, and spreading so much that I'm tired. Yep. But um, I constantly remember to think kind of vertically so that I don't tire out. That being said, I don't cop out and switch into head voice anymore. Right. Well, when you talk about the, those, those spread vowels or really going for that wide open belt, the, the, the danger there is the nervous system will kind of kick in and think, oh, it's time to shout. And then the muscles. So it's it, wh what do you do? Like when you're feeling really good and you can do that, how do you do you feel yourself overriding that urge to squeeze or go over heavy at the, at the vocal folds? Oh, that's so interesting. I think that my technique is so embedded now that I'm. I, I have found new resonance in the past couple of years of teaching, like every day I discover something else. So like, I never used to be like, and now it's mouth, cheek, eyebrows. Like that's very new too. So like, for me, if I'm on a G, mm, uh, let's say like E, mm, mm, I'm very itchy in the teeth. And as I shift up, hey, 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 I'm actually feeling a buzz as I go higher. Mm -hmm. So if I'm trying to sing a C, I don't have a piano app, but. Nah, something like that. Ah, I can't be like, ah, it's, I can't sing here anymore. So I need to shift. But as I'm doing this, I'm also thinking over and it's so many like made up visuals that actually do work. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, um, I'm thinking of like, eh, the good example is like in, in dying ain't so bad. Um, then dusty, ah, 
that's too much weight. Then they'll see, yeah. I think, yeah, and yeah, over and out. So I'm not going, ah. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Good. It's just a different color and it's a little too shouty. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting. Just, just the, feel the, easier. the subtle valve tuning that you do to go to the right place. It's, it's really well done. It's subtle, Very subtle. It's very subtle. Yeah. And, and, you know, you're a great example deep, deep. of an, oh, I'm sorry, we're getting a little lag time here on, <laughs> on good old uh, zoom here. Okay. I think we're caught up. Let's yeah, see. The deep, the hardest. So if I'm not prepared for like a, nah, 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 I have to be like, I think like a triangle here. If I'm, if I'm not locked into that, the straight tone, if I have to straight tone a D for like three or four bars and I'm not locked in, it's gone. So my visual is like this triangle that has to go forward, forward. And then the vibrato kind of brings it forward after. Interesting. So you, so, so you find straight tones a little more taxing than vibrato. On, on D's. On D's. D's okay. are like, yeah. 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 I mean, and then what is your approach above D? Like, let's say you've got to give a pretty intense E or even an F. Say it again. Uh, what What is your approach above D? Like, let's say you have to sing something rather intense on an E or F. I mean, it's just that I need to be speaking up here. But I'm not shouting. Right. Because freshman year, my teacher was like, okay, call a taxi you know, taxi. And I was like, taxi. I didn't know how to access that part of my voice, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's the same thing as like this, this, I mean, you can't see the visual on a podcast, but I'm yeah. like, she's, you know, she's making spinning motions spinning above, hand, above like the head. A, a princess Leia. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's that same lift, but I'm speaking higher. Right. Now I want to jump uh, to where uh, I first became aware of you and a lot of people, you got on YouTube really early. By accident. Uh, yeah, and and it's rather fascinating. Now, you were touring with Les Mis at the time. Wait, which video are you talking about? I'm talking about the breaking down the riffs. So that was later. That was six years after I was on YouTube. Oh, okay. So my first YouTube video was by accident. I was singing at somebody's house my senior year of college where youtube.com was literally not a thing. And, um, somebody put up a performance video of me singing. And I am telling you from dream girls. And I sort of did it as an opera joke and then a bell thing at the end. And then I sang the last note off key, which is also my brand. So I, um, he said a lot of like, yes, girl. And then he labeled it. And I am telling you white girl can blow. And then I had a lot of Facebook friend requests the next day because dream girls, the movie was coming out. And that's how everything started. Interesting. I do not know where I would be without that video. Interesting. So that's I actually amazing. got on because I, the first thing I saw was you breaking down the riff from Halo. Yeah. So that's the first episode of my web series. So that's like okay. six years after all of the performance videos had come out. And and that's when you were touring with Les Mis, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and. And you do something really fascinating in that is as you're, as you're teaching the riff, you encourage a little head tilt yeah. and that seems to kick it in. And I've, I've watched um, your coaching and you're, you're, you're very physical and you encourage a physicality. Um, so you do, you, if somebody's learning to riff, how do you think like those little physical moves assist? Um, well, there's two answers. One is, Part of my motto is like in episode one is like, uh, you too can riff, like everyone can riff, mm -hmm. except I don't believe everyone can riff. So like, I don't want to cross dreams, but I get a lot of questions. Well, how do I go as fast as Tori Kelly? Uh, most people can't, she's an alien, you know, like you can go as fast as you can go. And then I try to say, and then everyday scale, but people ask me, what did you do to warm up your riffs today? I said, I woke up and riffed. Like I don't warm up my riffs. I warm up if I'm tired, like vocally but in terms of like some days it doesn't move as much but i don't practice riffing that's something that i was naturally uh adept what is the word because gifted yeah i mean well you talked about going back as a young child you were you were trying to riff so you were already but that was like something in the in the anatomy of it i guess science yeah the science buff but 
Um, in the tilting thing, that's because the um, da, 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 that's an eight note scale mm-hmm. and it skips that note. So da, 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 da. And that's why I was like, well, why don't you try tilting your head? And they're like, whoa, that works, you know? So it was like a made up visual that like, that is a scale, except it's not hitting the fourth note. It's going, skipping to the fifth. And I tested the method out on my wardrobe supervisor on tour, who was basically tone deaf and she could do it. So I knew that it was like accessible to like the everyman. And then all the terminology of the whole step, half step was based on music theory, but also like, you know, double, double basic terms. And I would test them out on my best friend and be like, what do you think if people are walking on the street, they're going to be like easier to double, double up. What are you doing? But like, that made sense. Um, I don't know anything about solfege. So it's a lot of anti solfege. You know, if it's going down, I usually start the riff with one because you have to count, you have to hit seven notes. So instead of going seven, six, nine, four, I don't know how to count backwards, you know? So a lot of stuff is most of the breakdowns I come up with start with one and, Mm -hmm. you know, um, but the physicality is, something that the tilt thing is that was from episode one but like you know even little things like episode two she did it and I was like cool Jimmy Jim that worked you know what I mean it was also like collaborative and that worked for her and I'm like oh also there's no right answer so like in episode three when we filmed she was a very excellent riffer and we stopped filming and she goes I don't understand the breakdown you just taught me and I'm like if you don't understand it then nobody will so I had to rethink how I taught it um so again, when I'm doing these, they're suggested breakdowns. Yeah. And I know some singers will, will riff and they'll stay pretty motionless. Other singers will use like little jaw wobbles with each note to help delineate. Yeah. So I had a girl today who was doing, ah, uh, with the jaw. Yeah. And I, I just said, you don't need to manipulate it to make the sounds. Um, that being said, if I'm like, I'm like, I'm all for, relaxed jaw it's not making the sound but i do catch myself in like "Eh," like if i'm doing a certain thing it's moving but i'm not going ah to to change the notes right and you um i've heard some people talk about kind of feeling the riff in the vibrato to to get that spin and that agility i've never thought about it in the vibrato but i think about it if i'm doing a riff down i think of like an over and out feeling if i'm going like even for me like the Demi Lovato video that I did of um, I want all for your gains. Uh, just finding the thing. Hold on. Yep. Whoa. So the thing about that is like it's sort of like in the middle of like I don't like to use the word break. I don't use break. Like it's my yeah. break. I don't use that word. I just like sing everything. However, in pop singing, it's like. I won't, like, I won't. You either have to stay in head, I won't. And it, people ask me, is it harder to riff in head voice or chest voice? And I think for everyone, they would say the, the, the folds are thicker in, head vo- in chest voice, so it's harder to move. So yes, I do agree. It's easier for me to riff in head voice. So in the performance that I did, we actually had to, secrets, uh, dub the audio from two performances because the riff didn't land. So it's like, it was stuck. It was, oh, but I couldn't stop and I know videos are being taken. So at my recent concert, I was like, I really want to get a good video. And I sort of like thought of the, I did in the latest episode I did so long ago with Avery Wilson, he says they're like books on shelves. And I was like, yeah, no, no. And I just was like forward and out, forward and out through the cheeks. Like whatever visual is like forward and out for me Mm -hmm. or else it's like, Oh, Oh, it gets kind of slidey. Um, yeah, because you delineate so well. Like you can, every pitch lands. Not always though. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you have to go, oh. <laughs> no, for me, it has nothing to do with the vibrato. Okay. And do you find it uh, uh, trickier to riff up as opposed to riffing yes. down? Yeah. Yeah. Because when I riff up, which is barely ever, but nah, I mean, I feel a sense of like pumping nah, as opposed to, oh, it's going like, I can't even do it now. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm like really activating these muscles more. The, the stomach muscles. Yes. 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 Yeah. And um, 
let's take uh, a performance day because one thing people want to know is what what does performance day look like for you? Like, how do you get your voice ready um, if yeah, you have a I concert? Mean, I mean. Okay, so I've had to do concerts extremely hoarse and extremely 100%. So, like, the morning of my London concert, I had a concert at 1 o'clock, and by 10 o'clock, I was fully belting, and I never warmed up. And I was like, I could sing forever. I literally didn't do a warm-up. And then when I went to Germany twice, I don't know what that air is doing, but both times, I was struggling. So, like, I would get up much earlier and, like, my number one is panic, which is not a good, it's not a good thing, <laughs> but I'm being honest with that's where my process is of like, it'll never happen. And my friend's like, you have 12 hours. It's okay. Um, but instead of trying to even make a chest sound because it's really bad is like, even trying to just get any head voice going in the shower and, and humming. That being said, if you have to sing higher, I got to ease my way up there. Um, I don't really have a performance regimen though, because I pray that it's a hundred percent. And if it's a hundred percent, then ee, ee, hey, I'm fine. You know. But, so let's say it's not a hundred percent. You're going on. Uh, what to- What are some of your escape hatches that you use? Yeah. Well, first of all, like in just in Germany, the, the good thing was that the monitor I had was so clear. So I didn't have to over sing. So anything I could quietly get a sound out and really find a placement of not, uh, you know, any time that I was tired, I would, I wouldn't say I would use more head if I was really struggling. Like my friends know, oh, she's tired, but nobody else would know. Like, because I'm using a different type of weight. So if I'm like, you know what? not that I'm giving the audience any less, but like, for instance, I recently did this performance where I had like 15, 11 o'clock numbers. And the one song that I had, I had already had a video of it. I'm like, you guys, it's going to sound fine if I don't like give you belt belt. So every time I would be like, you know, emotion. Right. So I had to like conserve. And when I really needed it, I needed to give more, but if I had to conserve, I wouldn't give you like, I I would say it was more of a mark. And I also call like, Mm, quiet belt, a mark. Okay. A little bit like, oh my goodness, hey, like more of like a, <laughs> not even singing voice. That's also how I get people to make the sound. Because then when they, the minute that I say don't sing, they belt. It's crazy. Hmm. Like I've multiple times worked on belt songs and they're like, either they won't do it too heavy or they're in the, ah. Uh, the second that I'm like, you know, what did you eat for breakfast? And they'll be like, I had eggs. And then I'm like, okay, go. And they're like, wait, what? It's completely psychological with some people. Yeah. You give them permission to stop working so hard. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're, um, give us a quick overview. When you get a learning a brand new song, what's your process uh, for breaking it down? Um, brand new as in like, um, I'm originating it. Or uh, I just heard a cover and I can listen to resources. You know what? Let's take it from your originating it. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, you play piano, which helps. Yes, that helps. I would say the composer would probably have a demo of them singing it. Possibly really badly. And some of them are great singers. Mm-hmm. So the hard part about a bad singer composer is that I imitate them naturally. And I'm like, no, that's not, that's not how they, you know, that's not my voice. So then I learn it melody by melody and then, um, rhythm. And then if I'm doing like a recording, then I'm following exactly what's written. And then they say, okay, now play. And I'm like, okay, I'm playing ah, whoa, like lots of horrible riffs, you know? Um, but a lot of people are like, do whatever you want, but I have to make sure that it's like grounded in the story. I don't want to do anything extra. Um, in terms of like learning audition material, I mean, it really helps that I play piano. Yeah. Uh, and you, are, you yeah. tend to break it down technically first and then start finding emotion. And- oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would say in terms of like how to sing songs, I know how to sing songs, technically. I think that I'm always thinking about like, what is the lyric? What, what's the meaning? What, when, when I'm straight toning in vibrato is sort of uh, 
personal choice, but I think like I have in good intuition with it. Again, there's no right answer, but there's a certain style that like requires more of this, more of that. Um, in terms of like, sometimes I have to mark my breaths actually, if they're, if they're really wordy songs, I have to think about the phrase. Um, and sometimes I'm like, Ooh, how do I sing that note? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm playing around with it and making weird noises. Just to find the right color, the right intensity. The right color is the exact term. Yeah. And yeah. so, and so through that, through trying just different vowel sounds, depth of larynx, all of these things. And they all, I also asked them like, great. Now that I heard your demo, are we going for, and then I'll name like examples. Are we going for like, I have lots of different colors. So like, are we going for the Rihanna Natalie Weiss or are we going for Kelly O'Hara Natalie Weiss? Like what? And, and then I'm, I'm not copying, but I am using them as inspiration. Um, because I can give you different kinds of vibrato and style, or you want like musical theater and they're like, try this and I'll give them options. And somebody was once like, that's so fun. You can shop in the Natalie library. You know what I mean? You just can give different colors. And it, your learning process for that, was that just through really listening to singers intensely and, and trying to copy them and really understand what it is that they bring and then finding another artist to, to do I that with? I think it wasn't like calculated, to be honest. I think it was like, um, what's the word? Not like sponge. Uh, just, just exposure like, to lots of different styles. Exposure, styles. yeah. Because people used to ask me like, did you practice every day? And the, my answer is I never practiced and I practiced 24 seven. So literally I was never, now I'm going to do my exercises, but I was on the toilet going, you know, finding your, your cataloging sensation, mm -hmm. which is what we ultimately I have like to that. do. Yeah. And, uh, one final question when you need a, when you need a break, from all things voice, what do you listen to to just kind of relax your mind? I don't really, I wouldn't say listen. I'd say like, I mean, a, a Netflix binge or one of my dumb shows. Like okay. The, then what's your favorite music to listen to just for enjoyment? I, honestly, I put on Tori Kelly or JoJo most of the time. Those are my two favorite. Yeah, Tori's amazing. Anything like acoustic pop is what I love. Yeah. Looking at my last played. I mean... Sarah Bareilles is here on Most Played. I also love um, Mark Broussard. He's an excellent singer. I love Shawn Mendes, but that's just like, if I want to like bop in my yeah. room. Yeah. And then uh, just let us know if uh, where um, interested listeners can can find more about you. Um, I know you you have an extremely limited availability, but if someone's interested in, in coaching with you, because you do Skype lessons, yes? Um, yeah, I do Zoom on occasion, depending on- On occasion, on, yeah. your schedule, yeah. Yeah, and depending on like, it's Zoom for me is like best if I've met them in person or if they're preparing for something very specific um, instead of like a general like, because it's much harder for me to hear. Sure. Um, with the delay and the sound, but um, they can go to natalieweissofficial.com because natalieweiss.com wouldn't give me their domain and it's not even a website. <laughs> oh no. Somebody's tried, squatting on, tried, your, on your name? I know. I tried to pay for it and it's not even a working website. Oh, uh, yeah. that's horrible. So natalieweissofficial.com, it's long, but, and then that's on Instagram and Twitter, uh, the Natalie Weiss on both. All right. I want to thank you so much for, for taking this time out and uh, speaking with us. Thanks. And uh, look forward to more great music from you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. If you want to know more about me, check out my website, johnhenny.com. I've got some courses there for singers. Um, I have a free straw warm-up course uh, that you can get, so check that out. You can also get my book, Teaching Contemporary Singing, uh, at Amazon. Just look that up by John Henny. And until next time, to better singing. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.